Hello, you're watching Talking Europe. As European leaders ponder how to revamp their defense industries to support Ukraine, I'm joined by a guest who knows the challenges from a NATO, EU, and French perspective. Camille Grand is Distinguished Policy Fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations, where he heads the organization's defense initiative. He worked as Assistant Secretary General for Defense Investment at NATO from 2016 to 2022, and he has also held senior positions at the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs and at the French Defence Ministry. He joins me from Brussels. Uh, thank you so much for being my guest, Camille Grand. Uh, on the these new European defence initiatives, so the de defence industrial strategy uh, and the defence industry programme, these are known as EDIS and EDIP. Um, you've written that neither of those programmes will will match the immediate requirements that Ukraine has. Why is that? Well, they come from a good perspective, which is how do uh, how does Europe uh, organize itself to meet uh, uh, the uh, importance of defense industry in today's environment? Having said this, uh, uh, I'm afraid that in the immediate environment, there is neither the money nor the uh, support of the member states uh, and industry to make that um, allow those uh, initiatives to make a difference today uh, for the support to Ukraine and and to uh, be, uh, rebuild or, or or own stockpiles. They're, they're, they are going to be very useful if you if we look in the longer term, provided that the money comes uh, in 28, which is more or less the the, the cycle that they're announcing. Uh, so, so that's, but immediately they're not going to make a difference. So you're saying that these two programs, they could make a difference, a tangible difference by 2028? Yes, indeed. I mean, yeah. the, the intent, and that's a, a good intent from the Commission, is to say, okay, how do we make a difference? Uh, how do we use the, the European Commission toolbox to uh, bolster our industries, to develop an industrial policy in uh, the field of defense industries. Yeah. And that's well and good, but that's not going to make a difference given the money allocated before the next multi-annual financial framework. Uh, starting 27-28. And there's a question of political will as well, which you highlighted in your uh, position paper for ECFR, uh, which is that the Commission would have to find a way forward with the member states who are reluctant to Europeanize their defence policies. Just explain that a bit. Well, the, the tricky part is, of course, according to the treaties, uh, defence remains a competency for the member states. So the all the defense cooperation in the EU framework has developed under a more intergovernmental framework that rather with the traditional tools of the Commission. I believe it's a good news that the Commission has, has been paying more attention to this in the past few years and has been starting to play a role, especially when it comes to defense industry research uh, and, uh, and development of technology. Uh, but the, the, the tricky part is that as the Commission affirms its intention to become an important player in the domain, and hopefully with significant money on the table, there will be a tension with the Member States who will want to see what's the added value of the Commission and how is that going to fit into their um, uh, priorities and, and requirement. Uh, and so we're a bit in um, uh, uncharted territory there. Mm to see how we can use the Commission toolbox for a competency which will remain with the member states, which will continue to have most of the money and also define the priority. So let's get back to the short-term needs then in regards to uh, Ukraine. Uh, you wrote a position, a paper, uh, nearly a year ago, which had a 10-point plan uh, to fix the ammunition problem. Uh, and since then... Ukraine has lost Bakhmut and it has lost uh, Avdiivka. So is your sense that any of those 10 points have actually been implemented? They are being implemented, but they, I'm afraid, are being implemented um, uh, late. Uh, mm -hmm. So the problem with the uh, um, Europeans, and there it's not specifically the European Union, it's collectively, is that I think there is a good understanding of what are the challenges. There, there are some very good decisions taking place, but those decisions tend to take place too late uh, uh, if you compare with the urgency of the needs of the Ukrainians. 
We are seeing uh, the, the impact of, of the uh, bombardments conducted by the Russians on major Ukrainian cities. We need to fix the air defense issue and to really uh, bolster our assistance in that domain. Yeah, we and see- I, I believe the air defense question is linked to uh, this announcement we had recently from the French Minister of the Armed Forces, um, who said that the French government might force firms to put defense orders before civilian ones if manufacturing doesn't speed up, so manufacturing aimed at helping Ukraine with things like air defenses. Is that the right way forward, to go with things like requisitioning stocks and so on? Well, the, the tricky part is that um, uh, it's, it's really more about uh, critical component and subcomponent. So if you think of, of uh, um, uh, ammunition production or missile production, there are some components which might be microelectronics in, or, in, or very basic things like black powder, explosives, that, are, and that need to be prioritized for defense need. Mm-hmm. And I think that is what Minister Le Cornu was suggesting, to, enable, to avoid a situation where industry would be deprived of access to critical components uh, because, uh, so, because they, they wouldn't be available for defense use. So that is exactly what is ongoing at the moment. Um, and uh, I think it is, it is a fair request. You can't say on the one hand we're in a war economy and that this is really uh, critical, including for our own security. And on the other hand, say, oh, it's a pity uh, some of the, the key um, uh, uh, precursors for, for ammunition production are unavailable because we're competing with civilian needs. Kevin Grand, you've got a, a track record within NATO at a very high level, and the Atlantic Alliance is approaching its 75th anniversary, which will be marked at the July summit in Washington. There's a lot of talk in your policy circles about Trump proofing, right? So to make NATO and also the EU Trump proof. Do you think uh, anything is really moving on that, particularly perhaps when it comes to the defense? Uh, spending question among NATO member states? The critical question is for the Europeans to prepare for a whole range of scenarios. And all of them require a big effort when it comes to to defense. Uh, Not an an effort that is absolutely fiscally sustainable, but we have to be serious on defense and we have to be serious on defense over a a decade. Uh, To try and prove ourselves, that is being able to act with possibly less American commitment, but also uh, simply to face a a degraded security environment, no matter who's in the White House. And that requires uh, a sustained effort. I think it's within reach. The Europeans have already increased quite significantly their defense expenditure. Uh, We had only three allies at 2% in 2014 at NATO. Now we have close to 20 this year. So there, there has been a, 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 a European allies have turned a corner on this, mm. but it, it now needs to be sustained and, and, uh, all, and all countries need to join that effort. Uh, I've heard though policymakers in Brussels say that if Trump does come back as president of the US, then uh, the current level of uh, 2% that has been reached uh, is going to be not nearly enough. What, what would you say to that? I, I think it very much depends each, each, uh, from one country to another. There are some countries that have um, underspent for so long that they really need to probably go above uh, 2% in order to uh, rebuild a proper military. Others who have been uh, uh, slightly more serious can probably manage within that, that order of magnitude. So I think it's a sort of country by country situation. I wouldn't argue that the Europeans need to double their defense expenditure or anything of the sort. I would argue that the uh, Europeans simply need to be serious on defense and be, uh, in, in the grand scheme of things, around 2 or 2.5 percent for a few years to make sure that they have a, a proper military, uh, again, in a degraded environment, not because Trump is potentially re-elected. Uh, and also, you've argued that there has to be more alignment between the EU and NATO, for example, on defense planning. Uh, do you think NATO is more relaxed about the idea of an EU defense union? Because a few years ago, they were a bit uncomfortable with such ideas. I think, honestly, uh, the, both the NATO and the EU environment are not comfortable enough uh, uh, when it comes to cooperation. They're, tends to be about of institutional uh, competition, which is absolutely 
uh, not uh, useful in, in today's environment. So I think that both organizations need to turn to each other and see what they can bring to the table and how they can support each other. And uh, this is something that is uh, going to be, a, a, from my perspective, a very important endeavor in the coming months, because it's a good thing that the EU is more active, but the EU needs to work more closely with NATO. So both organizations need to be much more relaxed about how they work together, which comes with some political sensitivities, but there is also a degree of a lack of understanding of what they can both bring to the table. Uh, and on the uh, approval of Sweden and Finland to join NATO, uh, do you notice any concrete changes uh, since that uh, since that took place? Well, uh, the, the, the good thing is that Finland and, and Sweden are, are have been uh, EU member states for, for uh, close to 30 years now, uh, and therefore they really bring to the table a lot of EU expertise, which uh, is important, and I think they are both very committed to make the relationship between the EU and NATO work. There are 23 NATO allies that are EU member states, um, and uh, 23 out of 27 EU, member, uh, EU countries are uh, NATO allies. So it makes absolutely no sense to not uh, do a very deliberate effort to work together and to facilitate that relationship, uh, which again is uh, uh, not so much a, a, an issue of uh, how do we work together, uh, but uh, how, to, how do we make sure that the best of both organizations is brought to the table in today's environment in a coordinated fashion. Okay, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much uh, for being my guest, Camille Grand, Distinguished Policy Fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations. That's all for this part of Talking Europe. I will be back with a panel of MEPs at the European Parliament.